For those of you I don't know, my name is Drew Worden. I'm the Assistant Dean of the Entrepreneurship Program here at NEC, and I'm really excited to welcome you to a new residency called the Grow Your Art Residency here at NEC. It's the first time, I think, that the Jazz Department and the Entrepreneurship Department have collaborated on a residency like this. Uh, I'm going to introduce in a moment the panelists that we have here today, but wanted to mention real quickly a few other events as part of this residency you might be interested in. Tonight, there's a $5,000 pitch night competition. What? Yes. <laughs> Can you believe it? There's 12 uh, finalists, NEC students and alumni, that are going to be giving three-minute pitches to a panel and uh, competing for some award money to bring their projects to life. And then tomorrow night, Dave Douglas is performing a concert with NEC Jazz in Jordan Hall, and that's at 7.30. Pitch night tonight's at 6 o'clock. Concert tomorrow night is at 7.30. I'm really excited about the five individuals that we have here, and I, they're going to talk a little bit about their work, but I also want to brag about them quickly up front, because I don't know the last time a group like this has all been in the same room, and I'm really excited for what the conversation is going to be. So, first, Jennifer Chen has served as the uh, managing director of the American Modern Opera Company. She earned her undergraduate degree at Harvard University in history of art and is an MBA graduate of the Yale University School of Management. Her career has brought her from producing operas in dining halls to working with institutions including the Boston Symphony Orchestra, New York City Ballet, Peabody Essex Museum, and the Celebrity Series of Boston. Dave Douglas. Should we get to applaud Jen before we- We can. Dave Douglas is a trumpeter, composer, educator, and entrepreneur from New York City known for keeping a diverse set of ensembles and projects active simultaneously. His career spans more than 50 recordings as a leader, and his contributions to improvised music have garnered a Doris Duke Artist Award and two Grammy nominations. He's currently on faculty at the Manna School of Music and is a guest coach for the Juilliard Jazz Composers Ensemble. Dave is co-founder and president of the Festival of New Trumpet Music and artistic director of the Bergamo Jazz Festival. In 2005, Dave founded Greenleaf Music, an umbrella company for his recordings, sheet music, and podcast, as well as the music of other artists in the modern jazz idiom. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. And Mike Epstein? Epstein? Epstein. Epstein. Mike Epstein is the president of Epstein & Company, an international booking agency representing award-winning artists. The agency works with artists of all genres and has developed a unique process for helping clients achieve their goals, which I think he'll speak to that process more in a minute. In 2015, Mike launched Speaking of the Arts, a podcast which has featured more than 35 world-renowned presenters, artists, agents, and managers. Mike is a member of the Strategic Coach, the world's leading entrepreneurship coaching program, and is also a member of the Western Arts Alliance, Arts Midwest, Performing Arts Exchange, and the Association of Performing Arts Professionals. Welcome, Mike. And I'm so sorry to ask you this, but I have to ask you about the pronunciation of your last name, too. Braithwaite. Yes, Braithwaite. And Braithwaite oh, right. is the owner of Braithwaite and Katz Communications, a full-service public relations firm specializing in promoting the foremost jazz artists and events of our time. Since 1986, Anne has promoted the music of a wide range of musicians, including two NEA Jazz Masters, a MacArthur Genius Grant winner, a Pulitzer Prize finalist, and a Grammy Award winner. Anne works with the Montreal International Jazz Festival and NEC's Jazz and CI programs. Thank you, Anne. Yay. And last but not least, John Gerlich. John Gerlich is a multi-platform editor for the Boston Globe Opinion Pages and a member of the editorial board where he's been on staff since 2015. He was previously arts editor of the Boston Phoenix where he was the winner of two ASCAP Deems Taylor Awards for his writing about music. He continues to write about jazz and the arts for the Globe, Downbeat, and Jazz Is. Thanks, John, for being here. Okay, so I've asked the panelists to prepare responses to about five questions or so, and I'm hoping we're going to find some tangents along the way that we can all take and uh, then leave some room at the end for questions from all of you here in person or watching on your phone or computer or whatever on Facebook. So the first question, even though I gave a brief overview pulled out from all of your bios, but if we could just go down the line and in a few sentences, um, what does your life in music or the arts look like today? 
Um, yeah, so as Drew mentioned, I'm the managing director of the American Modern Opera Company, or AMUC. Um, we're an ensemble of 17 singers, dancers, and instrumentalists, led by artistic directors Matthew O'Coin and Zach Winokur. Um, and as a company, we explore, investigate what it means to tell stories using the various disciplines within the company and across them. Um, and so my life right now is um, still evolving. Um, we founded the company in 2017, and it's been uh, an adventure in finding how one works by alone, um, which is, I think, what many freelance musicians go through after graduating, um, and working uh, in a virtual team, so a team that exists in multiple time, time zones. Um, and also sort of discovering how, how, how we grow into the roles that we come into and sort of let go of things once um, the company comes to a point where what you need to expand. So it's been a personal journey. That's great. Um, my name's Dave Douglas, and I'm primarily a trumpeter and composer, touring artist, band leader. Um, but I've found that those roles in the arts have led me into some leadership positions over the years, um, community nonprofits encouraging young creative artists on the instrument, um, as well as directing festivals. Um, starting a music company slash record label 15 years ago was a big new page for me, and it's become sort of the overall umbrella for all the different activities I do. And I find that um, between myself and the staff, I'm involved pretty much every day in all aspects of uh, how we, of course, first of all, make the art and then how we work with the art and distribute it around the world. So that's been um, the path to how I got here and, and what I'm pretty much involved in full time now. Okay, I'm Mike Epstein, and for the past five years, I've been running a booking agency called Epstein & Company. There's three of us. We are working with 11 artists right now. As Drew mentioned, all different styles of music. Primarily, we book all of our artists in North America, a few of them in Europe, and at least one of them in Asia as well. In 2015, I started a podcast called Speaking of the Arts, which has been a really amazing learning experience for me and a great way to try to better understand from multiple sides of the table a lot of the challenges and issues that many of us are all facing in the arts, whether you are an artist or a presenter or a manager or an agent. Um, and last year we announced a partnership with an organization called the Music Link Foundation, and that is a national nonprofit organization. They work with a lot of teachers across the country and they offer discounted music lessons. So our partnership essentially means that at the end of the year we make a donation to the foundation because it supports what we believe in, which is trying to, in addition to working with the artists that we work with, create more of a, a way for arts to thrive. So this is an opportunity for uh, music students who would otherwise not be able to afford private music lessons to take those lessons. And prior to starting my agency, I worked at a larger one here in Boston for almost six years. Um, I was a music student at Indiana University, and I've been in Boston for almost 11 years now. And I'm Ann Braithwaite. I do PR publicity for artists, mainly jazz musicians, although also institutions. I do some work with NEC, jazz, the jazz and CI departments, and one festival, the Montreal International Jazz Festival. But what I do on a daily basis is Basically, I'm a matchmaker between the artists and the public via the media, people like John. I'm, he can say he's always getting, you know, I'm always reaching out to him. Hey, can you write about this? Can you do this? So I'm, I'm looking, when I start working with an artist, I'm looking to try to tell their stories. What's unique about you? What's different? Why would somebody like John want to write about you? Um, what are you doing that's unique to you, and that's not always easy to find with everybody. There are a lot of people that are really good musicians, but digging for that story might take a little time, but that's what I really am trying to do, and get people as much exposure in the media as possible to help their careers. Um, John Gorelick, and um, to pick up on what Dave said, it, I'm sort of multitasking by necessity, which I think you'll find true for 
artists, but also people who write about the arts. There are very few people who, whose sole job is writing about the arts. So uh, as Drew mentioned, I'm on the editorial page at The Globe, and mm -hmm. my primary function is editing uh, op-eds and editorials. And occasionally I write editorials or op-eds, and occasionally those are about arts issues, uh, arts policy, arts funding, public art, things like that. Um, but those are, are kind of extras to my primary job and what I'm paid for. And I'm not on the, I'm not in the arts section. I'm not an arts staff writer. So, but I think you'll find that true for, for a lot of journalists like musicians. They have other things going on. Um, and uh, that's just something to, to remember about, about what I do and what a lot of arts writers do. Um, and I think that sums it up for now. Great. Uh, so where I'd like to start, and Mike and I were talking about this a little bit before the panel discussion, but how quickly the music industry changes, and so how do we prepare students or recent um, graduates for that when they're going to leave school and finish? And so. I think we hear a lot about what the challenges are, and we're going to get to that in a minute, but what I'd like to hear from each of the panelists is what you think now in 2018 are two or three of the greatest opportunities for students that are about to finish school. And we don't necessarily have to go in a specific order. Um, so I think it's, it's pretty obvious that we're living in a time where the sharing of information and ideas is um, much easier than it has been ever before. And I think for artists, this means that an exposure to the work of others um, and the ability to, to expand the capacity for one's imagination um, is really uh, coming to this really exciting um, uh, apex, I guess. Um, and I, I think that means sort of expanding your, your capacity for um, imagination, both at the collective level of what it means to question, um, question what is included in the classical canon, um, what is included in the stories that we tell, how those stories are told, um, and at the individual level, what it means to construct a creative life, um, which is, I think, a theme that has come up already um, pretty strongly. Um, there, the paths that we have for better or for worse are really uh, impermanent, and I, I've learned that very um, uh, personally. And um, I think uh, if, if we hold ourselves to, to single paths, um, you sort of lose sight of a lot of opportunities. And so um, I guess curiosity and, and really taking in everything that um, is out there is really huge um, and can be really beneficial. You. Please. Um, I think the opportunity to be in charge of your own career, like Dave is, I think you kind of have to be these days as a music musician. It used to be that people, you know, record label signed you and they did all the work and you made music, which would be a lovely thing if that were still the case. But it's also lovely that you can do what you want and control your career and own your the rights to your music and things like that. So I think that's a really important thing. And the internet has made so much more possible in terms of connecting to audiences and things like that. Um, any other? That's pretty much what I have to say, but just being in charge and reaching out to people in many ways. I'm gonna pick up on some of the things you just said. So I've thought a lot about this question because it wasn't that long ago that I was a music student. And um, as Drew mentioned, as we all know, the industry, change is part of it. It's just the only constant is change and the rate of change is increasing. So you need to start with that. And that's okay because as Anne just said, there are a lot of opportunities when it comes to technology and everything. Um, interestingly enough, I never as a music student thought I would work in the music industry aside from being a performer. I never had that thought cross my mind once as a student. But I will say, and I have no doubt at NEC it's the same as where I went to school, because there's such a high standard for music students, believe it or not, you guys are actually being prepared more than you think to make it in the real world because the amount of work and discipline it takes, as you guys know, to get better at your instrument and to learn how to compose and to do all that 
you put far more time and effort into your craft than most other majors do in their respective fields. So that absolutely translates into however you're gonna pursue music because you already have the drive. A lot of people don't have that. Um, whether or not that's an opportunity waiting for you, I don't know, but the point I'm trying to make is that if you just, you know, stay, you know, stay assured that you've got that, okay? Because for me, as a music student, maybe it was just for me, that was, the, that was 10 times harder than anything I've encountered running my own business. It really was. Um, so I think there's some reassurance there. Um, I, I guess that's what people have been describing. That's why I had trouble with this question, because I think of opportunities as what you would see in the want ads. Uh, and it would say, trumpeter wanted, you know, stuff like that, or uh, arts writer needed. And uh, as people have been describing, I, th I think what people and musicians and other artists find is you have to do multiple things and basically be open to anything. And one of the things I found exciting is people like Dave who make a, uh, make a real go of, of creating this label and then having lots of stuff around it. And it's like, well, what's the best way to put my music out? Maybe by myself. And, and that's very tough. But there are other things people do. Um, uh, Firehouse 12 in, uh, in New Haven, which I don't know a lot about, except that I get lots of cool recordings from them. And that was just Taylor Hobynum's a trumpeter and a recording, his partner is a re uh, studio engineer, I believe. And they started this thing and it was basically a community building that now it's got a bar and it's got all this stuff going on. But it's got the, a partner. It's Amazing. Yeah, but the whole idea originally was, okay, how can we get our music out and get it heard? And um, I find not those opportunities, but those necessities of thinking, okay, what are other things we can do? What are collaborations we can do with other artists? What's the community I live in? Maybe there's a storefront that, you know, I could rent for cheap and do a music series there, something like that. And so I think it's a lot about building community with other artists and, and um, going from there and, and just not saying no to anything because, no, I'm a piano player. That's what I do. I don't do all this other stuff. And more and more you have to do all that other stuff too. Yeah. So I would just add to what John is saying. Um, First off, I would just point out that Taylor Hobynum plays the cornet, not the trumpet, and there's a... <laughs> Sorry. Please, can we... <laughs> I should know better. <laughs> we need more John Garrelicks in the world, um, which is part of what I wanted to just say on top of agreeing with what everyone has said. Um, community organizing for the arts and banding together to make the work and make it happen. I think it's also important to look to the antecedents of previous groups that did this, like the um, Black Artist Group from St. Louis, or the AACM from Chicago, or Charles Mingus, who started a label in, I think, 1952, or um, Arts for Art, William Parker and Patricia Nicholson's organization that puts on the Vision Festival every year. Um, so this is, I don't want to say it's not a new thing. I think the way that it operates now is new and maybe there's a new urgency to it for artists. But I also think, I know for myself, it's been important to look at who was doing this in the past. And it's an opportunity that we have to, you know, think about how is this done? How has it worked? How has it not worked? Mm -hmm. How can we avoid that? <laughs> um, but also just looking down at what everyone at this table does, it's amazing to think about how many aspects of those jobs have changed. Arts management, mm -hmm. publishing, you mentioned, Dan, um, marketing, it's a new world, how that works. Print press is, oh, yeah. you're at the opinion page now, mm -hmm. right? And we're still hoping that you'll get some writing about all yes. of our work in there, but you know. Well, I, I do, uh, I, I do, uh, 
I do freelance stuff for the art section. I'm just saying that's not my. Th those are all extras. So we'll keep um, your foot in the door yeah, yeah. over there. So I, I'm trying to keep my foot in the door. But also booking has changed, as, as Michael tell you, and the recording industry we all know has completely changed. And I can just say firsthand, we're reinventing the wheel practically every day yeah. on how that's going to work going forward. Um, the very meaning of publicity mm -hmm. is different. And I guess, to bring it back to your question, Drew, I'm just saying that all these things, they're opportunities because it's a brand new world and you're entering a field where you have the chance to kind of invent how it's gonna work. Mm -hmm. And every artist can do that in their own way, supporting the music that they love and that they're passionate about. But it does mean banding together. No, nobody's gonna do it by themselves. Absolutely. No, I think every, a lot of people are saying the word community. I think that's really important to keep in mind, both as musicians, a musical community, but also the community of your listeners, the community that loves music, and how do you connect with them? How do you make them feel like it's special to be part of your community and make them feel like it's part of something bigger than themselves? Frank Kimbrough, I, this is just a little aside, but I was, think, I was thinking about community a lot because he's got a CD coming out of the entire Monk, all the Monk compositions, and he was talking about how he went back, for Monk's funeral, he went back to New York because he had to be at the funeral. And he, it really moved him because he really saw this music community and the jazz community especially was a very warm and welcoming place. And I think that's an important thing to remember that we're, we're all in this because we love the music and we need to support each other in that. So my follow-up question is the flip side of that. And in each of uh, your own careers, the question is, what few mistakes do you see emerging artists making? So I think if you think about the people you work with being established artists and pros that feel very reliable in terms of being in your own communities, and then young musicians who are maybe just entering the workforce, what are a couple mistakes that you see? Maybe they're common, maybe they're not common, and you know, of course without dropping any names or no, anything. No, no, of course. <laughs> One thing, I'll, I'll, I'll say something. Um, not taking every gig seriously. Some people, you know, oh, it's a wedding gig. It's a, you know, they think about, I, and of course you're not making your own music at these other gigs, but taking every, every time you have an opportunity to play in front of people, put your all into it and put your best into it because I've heard about people that don't do that, and they, their reputation starts to get around like, oh, they're not really a serious musician, they're kind of spoiled, they're this, that. And knowing that you, know, you might have to pay your dues. I know Fred Hirsch talks a lot about paying his dues and go and sit in at every jam session, go and play as much as you can, get out there as much as you can, meet as many people as you can, and always be a professional, because I think there are you know, some people that just feel like certain things are beneath them, but when you're starting out, and any time, there shouldn't be anything really beneath you. You want to do what you want to do, but you also, are, you're putting yourself out there and you're putting, every time you perform, so keep that in mind. Yeah, I, there's two things that I would speak to on that, and it seems, and this is just my observation, and it, it doesn't really matter if we're talking about new emerging artists or more established, but two observations I've had over the years are, the first is, Musicians, for whatever reason, are so good at making themselves miserable by comparing themselves to other people. True, that's another good one. And yep. the, so the, the best way to make yourself miserable is to compare yourself to somebody else. Yes. It's probably a human trait too, but musicians seem to do that better than most. So <laughs> if you can keep that in mind and just start to work on your mindset of not falling into that trap, and I have to do it every day too for you know, the business world and my competitors and all that, and just really keep that in mind. You'd be surprised at how much energy you'll get, positive energy you'll get, if you stop comparing yourself to somebody else, okay? Right. I would say the second thing I've observed is that is even though we are in the instant economy, don't discount the value of time, and don't discount the fact that this is going to take time, right. okay? Absolutely. Fred, to, to paraphrase what you are just saying, Fred Hirsch likes to joke that he's a 50-year-old overnight success story, <laughs> however old he is now. 60. Yeah, 60-year-old. Um, so it's going to take time, and that's okay, but it's not going to happen overnight. Right, so right, right. I think if you can keep those two things in mind, you're going to be better than you would if you didn't. 
And keep yourself focused on what your goal is with your art as well. And I, I really agree with you about not comparing yourself with others because there's always going to be somebody who seems like everything is happening for them. But just keep in mind, you're doing your own art and you're doing your own thing. And some people got a lucky break. I mean, Medusky, Martin, and Wood, they opened for Fish and then their music, then their audience completely changed. And I don't remember how that happened, but it wasn't... I don't think they were like, oh, I've got to open for Fish. I think it would just kind of happened organically. So... <laughs> Keep your eyes open. That's where we're talking about community and being out there and collaborating and making partnerships with people and just meeting a lot of people is really important, I think. And the other thing I was going to say about the whole you know, mistakes is not, not remembering to stay in touch with your fans because once people come and hear you, those people might want to come hear you again. So always try to get information about them. So you know, a lot of people have an email list. And it's, it's also going to social media, but I think... Even now, an email list is probably a good idea. So, um, you know, maybe a quarterly blast about what's going on. If you know where people are, letting them know when you're playing, because that's that's important for people. Again, they want to feel part of what you're doing, and if you connect with them, that's important. Um, as a journalist, the mistakes I encounter have to do with basic things that journalists want, which is they want a news hook. That's why it's called news. Right. So they want to know, okay, what's the event? It's like, oh, new CD coming out October 12th. Show at the lily pad November 13th or tour for new CD, blah, blah, blah. So it's some kind of information that, that makes it newsworthy. And, and then the other thing is the information itself. Uh, just getting all the relevant stuff so I have to don't have to hunt for it about, okay, where is this place? What's the street address? What's the cover charge? All that stuff which sounds uh, maybe not that important, where the most important thing is, I've got a show. You know, it's like, you know, the audience and the, and the journalist needs to know other, has to have other information to get that out there. Yeah, so, details matter. Details matter. Um, so the news hook and then information links to your music, um, links to your website. A nice photo link would be good too. Uh, all, all that stuff is really helpful. Uh, just to make it easier for the journalist to get your information out there. And if you've booked a show at an art gallery and they have a website, make sure they have a link to your music on the website because I troll for information all the time. It's like, okay, who's at the Regatta Bar this week? Who's at Lilypad this week for critics' picks? And sometimes it'll be someone I've never heard of and it looks interesting, but there's no way to listen to their music because there's nothing, there's nothing there. And all you have to do is link right. one song on whatever, whatever the thing is that people link me to all the time. Um, and it's like, okay, I know what this sounds like. I can describe it. Um, and so that would... That two things to remember: news hook and information, <laughs> basic information. I, I'm just going to interject here. I always say to to the people that work in my office, our job is to make the journalist job easier. It's easier to cover our artists. So all the things John's talking about is going to they make his job easier to make it more likely that he will do something about you. And there, there's all kinds of other stuff that I could go on about who's in the band, and it's like. Oh, Joe Morris is playing bass with you. Well, I've never heard of you, but I know Joe, and you know, it's like that immediately makes a connection that I can is familiar to me. So, etc. Um, the the first thing I have relates to what Mike was talking about earlier in terms of um, I think the the reality is is that conservatories um, up until very recently have not had programs like entrepreneurial musicianship and and the and musicians are entrepreneurs and I think um, the ability to translate your skills to people who aren't musicians and aren't in the arts um, is something that many schools have failed at doing um, and giving giving uh, yourself the language and the empowerment to say that you are a marketer you are a grant writer you are a producer you are a fundraiser um, is really huge and um, I think uh, can also unlock a lot of opportunities for um, 
the types of work that you're, you're seeking. Um, and, and the other thing um, also connects to the, the theme of community that we were talking about. Um, so I, I work with singers, dancers, and instrumentalists. And on a traditional opera stage, dancers are paid an amount, musicians are paid a little bit more, and singers are paid a lot more. Wow. Um, <laughs> and um, it's news to me. <laughs> uh, I, I, and and one of the one of the the fundamental tenets of the company of Amak is that we pay everybody equally. Um, that everybody um, puts in equal time and contributes um, an equal amount of work for um, what we produce. And so that should be uh, reflected um, correctly. And I think one of the mistakes that we make collectively is allowing um, undervaluation of our work. Um, and it's a lot easier said than done to, to achieve true value and true equality, but it's something that we all have to work on together. Um, and so now that Amuk is in a place where we can advocate for that among presenters and producers, um, we are pushing for it as much as possible. So um, when, when you are in situations where you can advocate for yourself and for the value of others, um, I strongly encourage that you do so. Wow. The word entrepreneur has been tossed around a few times just by a show of hands. Does everybody know what the definition of an entrepreneur actually is? Nobody? Maybe? Okay. An entrepreneur, so the word itself was, comes from a French economist in the 1800s. His name was Jean Baptiste And he said an, an entrepreneur is somebody who moves resources from a lower level to a higher level of productivity. That's it. Okay. So it has nothing to do with starting a business. It's not the New York Times magazine cover image of Steve Jobs that we all know. It's a mindset. And I think there's no surprise that we've all mentioned the word at least once when we've said something. So the fact that you guys have this entrepreneurship component to your uh, coursework is something I never had. And I've had to really be a life, I mean, I will always be a lifelong student, but I've had to really learn a lot on the job for better, for worse. So, um, you know, I think if you just keep that in mind, it's a mindset, it, it helps me, you know, whether it's something seemingly ins insignificant or big, approaching it with that mindset really helps. Yeah, and you know, we, this came up yesterday in the talk, which is that um, calling it entrepreneurial musicianship is a master stroke because that used to be known as arts management. Uh, yeah. And when you <laughs> transferred over to arts management, it was like a way of saying, well, I'm no longer really a musician, uh, which is not something that has to happen and you should never give up your musicianship. So the fact that we're now looking at it from the standpoint of how does this serve all of us as artists, and we're not giving up that side of ourselves in order to look at the context and the presentation and the platforms on which our music is going to survive. Um, so back to the specific question about mistakes musicians make. I, I, this whole time, I mean, everybody said so many brilliant things, but I could only remember, and it's kind of a mishmash in my head, whether Steve Swallow said this or Ray Drummond. But it was like, there were four, it was show up on time, be prepared, pack your costume on top, <laughs> and strive for tone. <laughs> And I think you can't really go wrong, and I, I, I hate to say it, but I do see those very fundamental issues, and it's not just meaning be prepared for the rehearsal you're going to, although that would be good, um, but any aspect of what we work on, right? I mean, it, it's, it's just a, a matter of, I mean, what is that, who was it? Was it Yogi Berra that said that 90% of succeeding is 10% of showing up or what, something what like that? Woody Allen, Woody yeah, Allen. yeah, yeah, yeah. Just showing up. Um, and it's so true. And I think that, um, especially in this period where we're reinventing what a career is and how platforms work and what our work is, that you know, showing up and being there and being prepared is even more important. Great. Uh, I realize Not I to forgot be a to scold. I feel like a scold now, so yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's OK. Um, I forgot to do this at the beginning, but I'd like to just take a quick poll of who's in the room. Who's a current music student right now? <laughs> Trick question, I suppose. Huh? And who's uh, an alumni? Great. And is there anybody that is neither and is visiting from the public? All right, great. Welcome, everybody. Um, okay, so I want to pivot to 
another topic, and this is about, well, it's about more mistakes and failure, actually, but I think it's really important. I think in music school, we think a lot about perfectionism and about preparing something until it's 100% perfect, and then we're going to put it out there in the world for other people to see and respond to. And I think it can be very shocking for students when they leave school, and real world is a little bit different than that. And so I want to ask you all a question that I think will maybe humanize you a little bit. I think it could be easy to look at all of you as hitting home runs every time you step up to the plate because you're successful in these different areas. So the question is, is can you tell us about a time where you experienced a setback or a failure in your professional life that led you later to a success? So like a, a personal example for me is like my very first grad school audition when I was 22, like I totally tanked. But from that, I learned how to prepare better, and I got into a different grad school, which led to X, which led to Y, which led to the job that I have here now. And so while that was really devastating in that moment, it actually led to the success that I didn't know was going to be possible later. So are, is there something that sticks out in your mind that you'd be willing to share? I've got so many failures. I've got way more failures than I have successes. Uh, one of my favorite failures was when I tried to book my own tour as a band leader for the very first time, and I got a letter from Jazz Club Karlsruhe that said, Dear Mr. Douglas, we are not interested in you or your music. Please stop contacting us. Oh. And, I, you know, I should have framed it. It's so wonderful. And I just persisted. And uh, I think you can only... I mean, draw a lesson from that? I don't know, but I think you can only take failure as a chance to learn and improve and, and keep working. And boy, I, I fail every day, thank God, because I learn from it. I have to piggyback on what you just said. So I wasn't, this was before I was doing my own agency. I was working at another one, and I wasn't trying to book a show or anything. I was, everybody's heard of the Village Vanguard in New York, famous jazz club. Uh, I wasn't trying to book a show. I was simply trying to get through to them to make sure that our artist's promotional material had showed up for that week's engagement. And I called and called and called. That's and a finally, tough, tough call. Yeah. The, and finally, the legendary Lorraine Gordon answered. And she, I, I, she, I was so happy somebody <laughs> answered the phone. <laughs> so I immediately went, oh, hi, this is uh, Mike Epstein. And I want to just make sure that uh, Brian Blade's material. Yeah, who is this? Uh, this is Mike Epstein, Brian Blade. Mike, do me a favor. Don't ever call here again. And she just, <laughs> bam, hung up the phone. <laughs> um, but yeah, to your point about, uh, I'm not sure where I was going with that, but it's no, a funny that's a, story. That's a good, <laughs> I guess the failure for me was just, you have to understand, like as someone who's a jazz fan and everything, and that's you know what I'm passionate about, my first interaction with the legendary Lorraine Gordon didn't go too well, but it didn't stop me from right. you know going down the path. So, I, I have a, that, that story. brings to mind a similar story of getting <laughs> hung up on the phone. Nat Huntoff, who was a legendary writer of, about many things, including music, yeah. Um, would I, I finally realized he only called on the weekends about music when I wasn't in the office. So he would, he would call and leave a message. Oh, I love this artist. I just have to write about it. I love them. Call me back. I want to talk to you. So I'd call back on a Monday or Tuesday, and inevitably he wouldn't talk to me. He'd say, I can't talk to you. Now I'm writing about the Fuhrer click. So he was so, it was so shocking because on the message he'd been so expansive. And so you, you have to learn, I think any of us have to learn to have a thick skin and just understand that, you know, that was a lesson for me and writers on deadline are not always going to be polite and that's fine and you, it's not personal. So when, as they, you know, when people, if people hang up and you don't take it personally, unless you, unless you were really rude to them or something, but I don't think any of you will be. Um, what else? Other, my only other, I mean, I'm sure I've had many failures, but um, I think early, early on, I missed a journalist deadline and I will, you know, now I'm like, that's the most important thing. Anybody needs something in, in the press, you do it right away because it's super important or your client's going to lose out. Um, the other thing was, you know, I work with artists I believe in, and earlier on, sometimes somebody asks you to do a favor, oh, can you please work with my wife who's a singer, or, you know, whatever, and I, I did that a few times early on, and I realized that's never a good idea. If you don't, if, if I can't call John and say, you, I really love this person, and I wouldn't if I don't love them, so it, it goes back to following what you really believe in and following your dream too, but um, and not letting other things sideline that in a certain way. Um, 
Sorry, I've been kind of free associating on failure. So uh, um, was it when I was waiting on tables and broke the salt shaker and didn't clean it up afterwards and they seated the next party and they had salt at their feet and uh, I, and that led to my success as a journalist. Um, <laughs> but um, I do remember specific things happening early on, like maybe the first piece I did for the Boston Phoenix, it might have been, it was like, the first piece I did for the Phoenix was I freelanced a piece about the Fringe, great uh, Boston trio, and um, I'm finally in the door, the editor's got my stuff, and the way he edited you on paper, the music editor at the time, was he, you brought it in on paper, <laughs> And he sat there and he had an electric pencil sharpener and zzz, and he started editing. And he got to one sentence and he said, he was reading, he said, uh, I don't know what you're talking about here and neither do you. And he just crossed it out like that. He didn't even pursue it. It's like, let's move on. And it was just sort of one of those cold water in the face moments. And it wasn't the end of anything. And um, I don't know what it led to particularly, but I, I at least learned to expect things like that. And I think musicians can probably give many examples. Um, uh, I, I interviewed a musician once who said he, uh, he, he had done well with his friends and at school playing, and he finally got a gig playing with a, uh, a band out in the Boston suburbs where at the time there was lots of music uh, big bands playing, you know, supper clubs and stuff like that, and swing bands. It was all these older guys, and um, who working musicians. They played the ice shows seven days, you know, ice capades like seven shows a week, and then they would do this other gig on Sunday brunch or whatever. But he said it was the first time I ever got yelled at for making a mistake. It was like. No one ever did that. And um, I don't know, I think we've all run into stuff like that where someone very abruptly says, you don't know what you're doing, that's wrong. And you sort of have to accept that and how you process it sort of determines whether you're going to go on, I guess. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Um, we've talked a lot about musicians being able to do everything, but um, while you can do everything, uh, you really can't. <laughs> and I think the times when I have been most disappointed in myself is when I didn't ask for help um, and tried to put on so many hats that I could was sort of giving um, inadequate attention to each of them. Um, and while you can be held accountable um, for all those various hats, um, the actual execution um, can suffer and uh, is, is ultimately worse for everybody else. So. Um, just uh, be, be really humble in that, I think. And I uh, delegate, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 Great. We received a question from the Facebook Live audience. And then we're going to go to questions that any of you have. Um, the question is, for today's indie musician, there are so many things to do to promote their work. Websites, social, midi social media, videos, etc. For an artist starting out, what is the most important element to get the ball rolling? Okay, I would answer this by trying to just get a better understanding of what the artist's goals are, but if you have a market of one, that's much better than a market of none. So rather than spend all your time trying to make sure all of your social media platforms are 100% covered all the time and et cetera, et cetera, um, I, would, I would ask yourself, you know, what, is, what am I trying to do? Am I trying to get somebody to buy my music? Am I trying to get someone to buy a, a ticket to my concert? Am I trying to increase my followers on a specific platform? And I would get really granular and, and focus that way rather than what do I do to get the ball rolling you know, really quickly? And I'm sure um, if we had the opp opportunity to speak, I'd understand the question a little bit more. But I, I would not get overwhelmed by you know, this moment is the end-all, be-all. It kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier, that you, you should use time to your advantage, and it's going to take time. But people who are more, more organized and focused on very specific, measurable goals 
I think tend to do a little bit better than if you get overwhelmed with, again, maybe comparing yourself to another artist who, may, who put up a video and it went viral and it seemed like that's all that they did. That's not usually the case. So just you know, be very purposeful and specific about what, what are you trying to get people online to do as far as your craft goes. I think you nailed it. Yeah, I think so too. I think that's that's. It. But 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 big takeaway for me from what Mike is saying is it's just it's really hard to say without hearing the music and knowing what the objectives are. Right. Because just like we've been saying, there's so many different ways of doing it now and so many opportunities, and you sort of have to invent your own platform. Right, so right. without knowing what the work itself is. It's hard, to, it's hard to get Mike to call Lorraine Gordon at the Village Vanguard for you if he doesn't know what the project is. Yeah, Questions from any of you in the room? No questions? Yeah. So I've been trying to formulate how I'm going to ask this question for a while now, but in terms of interacting with Yeah, so just to briefly restate <laughs> the question for yeah. the online viewers too, I think the question was what are some of the best ways to use YouTube as a platform? Or, or just interacting with, yeah, like non, non just getting your recordings out there, yeah, whether it's doing, you know, podcasts, YouTube, things like that, because I feel like that's where just a lot of people are going to get whatever it is they're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, we, we've had this conversation recently as a company, and um, I think for, for, for the platforms that are more feed-based, like Facebook and Instagram, um, we're, we're starting to fundamentally shift how we approach those, such that they're not only message boards for our content and when things are happening, but also a way for us to connect with people on the, on the level of what inspires us, um, what... what um, what are our artists interested in? Um, and it could be anything from Sid Charisse dancing on a table to um, a concert that happened yesterday. So it's, it's not just about what you are creating, but also um, sort of a personal brand that you're building about um, who you are. Um, and I think, um, I think that, that opens up more points of contact as well um, to other people so that you're, you're not only posting when you have something to post of your own. Um, and so in, in this day and age, volume speaks very loudly. Yeah, I recently did an interview for the podcast that I do um, with the person who's in charge of social media marketing for the um, label Ground Up Music. They're, if you've heard of Snarky Puppy, Ground Up Music, they're a great example of doing great content marketing across all different platforms. But we've got, we, we spoke, I asked her specifically about how do they approach the content that they put out on Facebook and how do they approach it on Instagram and, you know, shameless self-promotion, you can listen to the episode on speakingtothearts.com. But some of my biggest takeaways were kind of what you're just, your observations, which is that, and one of the things I asked her was, do artists need a website now? Or, or will we get to a point where it's pretty clear they don't? Um, because you can use those platforms to serve a specific objective. 
So if the objective, you know, in my world, it's, all, it's about touring and, and shows. So if the objective is to get tickets sold, how can you best use those platforms? And we talked about a lot of different strategies specific to each one that you can do. Um, you know, and you've, it's no secret that one of the best ways to learn is to just experiment on either platform. Mm -hmm. But I also think you don't want to discount what is the goal behind what you're trying to do. You know, are you just trying, are you just simply posting a video because you can? Well, that's fine. But is it in context with a larger campaign that involves a tour and an album release and a publicist and a record label? And, you know, then, then all these things become very strategic. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a lot of thought and purpose behind the people who are doing it su successfully and the ones who are kind of clearly just throwing stuff up because they can. You know, you can tell, right? I mean, if you just look at the videos and the podcasts and everything that you listen to and that you watch and everything and the ones that you keep listening to and you keep watching, it's because they probably share some common characteristics as opposed to the ones that you don't even know about. I'm not sure. I think people, this is not answering your question, but I think people still need websites, at least in dealing with the media. John, do you agree? I mean, when you first want to look up something, where do you go? Um, I'm just curious, because... I, I Google it and then see what the options are. Uh -huh. And usually, I hate to say this, but usually the websites aren't, aren't helpful. Well, they're not usually updated, like, right? It's like the musician's personal website, I, maybe it's just not their emphasis, but some of them seem like they haven't been updated for years, and it'll say, it'll go to tour, because generally, I want to see, oh, so-and-so's coming to Scholars, who's, who's he or she with playing with right. this time? That's, that's always the most frustrating thing for me every week when I do concert picks for various outlets, where I'm thinking, oh, so-and-so's coming. I like him or her. I wonder who's in the band. Mm -hmm. And I cannot find out. And it's just very hard to, you know, write a blurb that says, so-and-so's coming, she's really good, and I'm sure whoever she has with her will be good too. And I don't know, I don't know if it's a quartet or a duo or a big band, but I'm sure it'll be good. So that's just a very weak recommendation. And it's just, um, it's just that's like the most common frustration for me is, Maybe it's just the well-known musicians, I don't know. But because but they're the ones who are on tour. But it, it's just, uh, uh, and it's like I say, I go to the website and it's, the news is not new. The tour information is like, here's the dates I'm playing. It's like, yes, I know you're coming here on the 12th. But there's uh, very little, very little of the information that I actually need to, to, to help the musician, so. Right, and John, then you could probably go to the person's Facebook page and try yeah. there. Yes. Sometimes that's more right. updated. Yes. Or you go to their Instagram feed, or you check them out on Twitter, go back yeah. to their page, go to the venue website. Yeah. So you're like running around between right. all these yeah. platforms trying to get the information. And yes, all that takes John's time away right. from other things. And it is true. Do. It's like, well, I'll go to Facebook. And, and with certain things you find out, it's like, okay, the best place to go for this particular person is Facebook. Facebook. That's mm -hmm. his thing. And that's where I'm going to get everything. But uh, a lot of times it's this little uh, steeplechase of like, you know, you start at the presenter's site and the presenter links you to Facebook. And then it's like, okay, uh, where's so, the information? You know, it's like, <laughs> You go to the booking agent's website. Yes, right. They will most likely have the Well, that's the other thing. At the website, <laughs> I'll see they'll have contact information. It'll say uh, manager, press, and some, you know, maybe something else. And Stylist. Stylist. My <laughs> case. <laughs> so it's, but it seems like if I'm actually emailing the musician's manager, it just shouldn't have to get to that Interesting. part. Because well. the manager's, especially maybe the manager is the tour manager and booking the tour and doing all this other stuff. So it's, to figure out who's the point person and who has the information that I need, it's it's very can be tricky sometimes. So I, I just I want to jump into a, another aspect of, that I think I heard in your question, which was about just you know interaction with content and with specifically recordings and potentially sales, but you know interest in what an artist is doing as opposed to just listening to everything free on um, the, the various Google 
platforms. And, um, you know, I'm a big cheerleader as of about, starting about six months ago, of Bandcamp as a platform for the future for independent artists. Um, Greenleaf Music, dot com, my <laughs> label, uh, that's been now about 15 years of existence and we're constantly upgrading how we manage this very situation. And um, Bandcamp about a year ago announced that they would start Bandcamp for labels. So now we moved the whole front-facing store platform of our work to Bandcamp and there's samples of everything available there. It's a place where a lot of people can listen to a lot of different artists, but they can also be aware of everything that's happening at Greenleaf Music. There's more than 60 titles. There's also a lot of exclusive content that we make just for the subscribers to the label. Um, there's a seamless interaction between our label website and my personal website and our Bandcamp page now that makes things pretty fluid and easy to update. And as to your question for interaction, I feel like I get more hands-on communication from the people who are listening to our music than I ever did before, including when I was at major labels. Um, so I'm, I'm really, I'm thinking Bandcamp is a good, place to go and we're, we're also now in the process, I've done 55 episodes of my podcast which is called A Noise from the Deep um, and you can rate us and review us on iTunes, it <laughs> helps more people find the show um, but uh, we're, some of that is going to live at Bandcamp now too and, and we're quite close to their creative team which is I would say some brilliant people that have been in the business a long time and they're kind of coming up with this new platform that, um, that I feel is an antidote to streaming sites like Spotify or Pandora that I'm not supposed to say this because I own a record label, but I, I still feel like the compensation to artists is problematic oh, yeah. at streaming sites. Yeah. And so, short of buying CDs, which a lot of people don't want to do anymore, I, I think Bandcamp is a good place to find. They have a really good app where you can, whatever your Bandcamp catalog is, you can access it all very easily. And I, I think that in terms of this interaction with artists and with listeners, it's, I think it's a really good model. We're, we're, we're excited about it. Follow up? Yeah. On me? Um, so like, Well, every label and every artist can use Bandcamp how they want to, and how we choose to do it is Bandcamp as a label. So you can buy individual releases, but it's also a really good deal to buy an annual subscription and get access to the entire catalog, including music that we only release in that format. Which I, and I do a session every year where I record 12 tracks, and they're released one track a month, and they only come out that way, and... As an artist, I have to say, I enjoy creating the work that way in a sort of a, you can digest one track and in a month you're gonna get the next track and each one completes a piece of the puzzle. At the end of the year, we make CDs and we send them to the subscribers. Um, so it's fun on an artistic level, but I, I also think that it gives people who are interested in the kind of music that we're doing, a chance to sort of be a part of it and be involved. Another question. Great, we have one from online. Let's, uh, I think we could really go down the rabbit hole with this one, so let's, <laughs> I'm gonna put a number I think I already did that, but. <laughs> what, uh, <laughs> let's just keep it to like one to two artists maybe. What current artists are engaging their audiences in unique ways, Ooh. and what methods are they using? Wow. That's a good question. Notes. Well, I, so I already mentioned Ground Up Music and Snarky Puppy, I think, are really good examples of that, because they have the unique advantage of, it was a band, but then it was a record label, and now there's bands under the record label, so they're kind of trying to figure out, similar to what Dave has been talking about, how do they engage with their followers um, online correctly. 
And so that's kind of one of the first thing that first that comes to mind for me. Um, I, you know, I, I I always try and all the various content that I see, music content that I see, I'm always trying to take it in context, right? Because I'm always trying to think if this is it's successful, meaning maybe there's a lot of followers. I'm trying to think how can I use this and help my own artists do it. Um, so, uh, you know, I track a lot of different bands and a lot of different genres. There's a great free service um, called Next Big Sound. If you never heard of it, nextbigsound.com, which is now owned by Pandora. Hmm. Next Big Sound uses predictive analytics to aggregate all this data from all the platforms that we're talking about to, to, to essentially try and predict the next big artist. Next big artist meaning this artist has like a lot of followers and stuff like that now. So it's a, you should definitely take advantage of it because you can sign up and follow different artists and you can look specifically at what it is they're doing that's getting more interaction and more um, followers and likes and stuff like that. So definitely you take advantage of that because it's free. Next <laughs> Well, oh, go ahead, John. I, I don't think I have an answer. I don't know. Like an artist who uh, is doing something, a, a particular... Well, I've already said I, I don't like the websites, and uh, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I don't know. I have to go to the Greenleaf site because it sounds really good. Yeah. And well, except, thanks. Please do. Uh, except when David comes to town, I usually know who he's with because... <laughs> There's enough information out there, but um, uh, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what, what would be a particular artist. Yeah, I mean, I know Maria Schneider. This going back a ways, she was one of the pioneers in, with Artist Share of reaching out directly to audiences and getting her records fan funded and things like that. And she's been very successful at it. Not everyone is or can be. She had a pretty big fan base before, but she's really. She was a model of reaching out before I think a lot of people did that, and it's and it's worked for her. But like I said, it hasn't worked for everybody in that format, so I'm not sure. And then she would, like Dave does, exclusive content just for her followers, helping to watch her in the process of making her CDs and things like that. And, and again, it, would, it goes back to engaging the audiences in some way, and she, was, she has been very successful in that. Yeah, has everybody heard of Artist Share? Do you guys know what that platform is? So it was really one of the first crowdfunding opportunities um, for artists. Mm -hmm. I think the guy who started, his name is Brian Camilo, and I, I want to say 2002 or 2003. So this is way before Kickstarter and all those things. And thanks for plugging one of the artists that I get to work with. <laughs> yeah, Maria Schneider has yeah, been a great too. example of using that platform to engage and build an audience. So when she goes to do a new album, which is a very expensive endeavor for a large ensemble like hers. Well, especially she, when she makes a booklet. I mean, she, like yeah. she did with the last one, it was huge well, and, and beautiful. Yeah, and, and that's just that she knows, she puts in so much time to make sure that the fans who are supporting her feel like they're getting more value than they're giving. Mm -hmm. So that's something else you can keep in mind. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't plug any of my other artists, I and mean, you should check out all of them. Like Donnie McCaslin is a great example. He's yeah. on tour right now and has an unbelievable um, new project out, but specifically as far as what to look for online that's been working is um, some of the new singles from his album, the tracks, What About the Body is a track from it. You can look up the video for that complete departure from, it, from anything he's ever done, and it seems to really be resonating. And he has a lot of support from his label, Motima. He's a, he was on Greenleaf for a lot yeah. of years, yeah, and great. after recording with David Bowie, he got a really nice piece of support from Motima, and I think it's fantastic. Great. And he's great. definitely using the platforms in an interesting, mm -hmm. innovative way, mm -hmm. for sure. That was also a freakish connection when you think of Medeski, Martin, and Wood opening for Fish, because Fish wanted them to open, and mm -hmm. David Bowie starts coming to these Donnie McCaslin shows and says, wow, I want this, I want to make music with these guys. And all of a sudden, Donnie's band finds himself being right. Right. David. And all, this whole other audience opens up, but it's the kind of thing you can't, plan for no, really. I, th it's I think Maria was involved in that too and yeah, in, in helping mm -hmm. him to know about Donnie. But uh, yeah, that's that's the thing. Just that's where just being open to all possibilities. Obviously anybody you know some famous musician wants you to play, do it. 
but um, you, you can't always knock on their doors and get it to happen. It just, you know, keep being a professional and doing what you do as well as you can, and those opportunities can come to you. Yeah, let's not forget that Sonny Rollins played with the Rolling Stones back in the 70s. That was kind of a big thing. And uh, that, um, uh, David Murray used to open for the Grateful Dead. Yeah. Remember that? So all of these... A lot. Wasn't it Miles Davis was warming up for Jefferson Airplane on that famous poster from like the late so. six, something like that? I, but I, I would I, just say, oh, go ahead. I remember John. Miles' autobiography. He complained about opening for the Steve Miller Band, I think, uh. but which was <laughs> such a problem. He wasn't right? very nice about <laughs> Steve. <laughs> but it was, so lucky. Um, well, I was, but I was it was say, it was one of those things. It was at the I think it was at one of the Fillmore's or something, and it was like yeah. introducing Miles's music to this rock audience, and so. But I, I, I just to go back to you know I was trying to rack my brain to think of people examples of people using these new platforms well, and th there's quite a lot of them actually. There's a trumpet player named Keon Harold, who, oh, yes, aside from being just a great musician is sort of pioneering this new music that's somewhere between hip-hop, rap, jazz, R&B, soul, and using the, he's on, I, I, I tried to look up very quickly to remember what label he's on, and I got to the Amazon page and everything, and John, I couldn't find the information anywhere. So there you go. But, so that's a counterexample, I guess, in that instance, you're not using the platform well. But I, I, everything I've seen, Keon is doing great work musically, but also supporting it online. There's so another guy named Christian Sands, oh, yeah. who has a new record that's on Mac Avenue. And they're releasing singles, and they're using every platform, yes. probably including some platforms I'm not even on, um, to release this single and to highlight it. And there's a video with it. And it's just everything's really well done. And the information is there. And of course, the music is great, too. Um, of course, everyone's talking about Kamazi Washington, who you can't talk about the current jazz scene without acknowledging how present he is in all of these formats and places and, and how, you know, who would, everyone's always saying, oh, this is the age of the short attention span. Well, Kamazi released a three CD first album called The Epic, and it was just an enormous news story and an enormous musical event, and um, the way that they worked with all of that musical work, I think, was really effective in the current environment, um, which is changing, right? Because if you, if you think about it, Greg Osby, he's had a record label longer than I have, Inner Circle, and he's supported a lot of emerging up and coming artists. John Zorn has a label called Sodic that has, I think, maybe the biggest catalog of any of the, you know, late 20th century startup creative music type labels. Um, and then I came up with this other name, this guy that you might have heard of that played with Steely Dan back in the 70s. His name is Wayne Shorter. <laughs> If anyone's using the platform in an interesting way right now, it's Wayne who just released his chamber music and orchestral music and his quartet music along with a very large graphic novel of artwork. And there's videos floating everywhere and it's just like, if you, you know, this is what he's always wanted to do. And the platform didn't exist until now. And I think I saw that on Facebook. If I'm not mistaken, it like yeah. popped well, up. It was it's like because is Wayne on Blue Note now or something? It was wherever it's on uh, Blue Note. Yeah, yeah. So this little video ad came up with you know all about the, and the, the funny thing was I I thought is this a new recording or a book or what? And I it seemed to be everything, but it was very you know it, it's it made an impression. And it grabbed you. Yeah, yeah. it grabbed me. Yeah. Well, that's that's the idea, right? Um, I have a question about, um, Dave, you mentioned about subscriptions through Greenleaf, um, which is all the streaming services, uh, Pandora, Spotify, Apple Music, um, which seems to go with the whole idea that recorded music should be free and no one should have to pay to listen to anything and... Um, uh, 
Can I say something that's going to make me really unpopular online? You buy your subscription to Spotify and you buy your phone and your wireless headphones. So it's not free. Well, my question is yeah, for sorry. the artist, though, artists I've talked to is that say they get basically no remuneration from these. It's like you get, you know, minus 0.01% for every play or something. You know, you get, you get nothing. And so... I mean, Dave, you mentioned that, that you have a subscription where people can get exclusive things. Is your music also on Apple Music and Spotify and Pandora and all those things? Or That's a really good question. And of course, I can't say anything bad about anybody. <laughs> um, it, it is a problem exactly as you described it. Uh, we also switched our physical distribution last year and we were working with a company called Red Eye Worldwide, which we're really happy with and they're great. They're also really excited about streaming services, mm -hmm. Spotify. And so I feel like it's really hard to understand what it is and where it's going. And for the moment, I'm listening to my distributor and they're saying that it is, but you're right, it is minus point oh oh oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, think, I think it's roughly 1500 streams is what streaming services consider one, the, the equivalent of one record sale. It's approximately 1500 mm. Well, Doesn't mean you're seeing a lot of money though as a no. copyright owner for royalties. It's, it's tough, it's, yeah. I, I, you know what, I, I don't wanna say too much because I think that I read a lot about it and people have takes on it and I just feel like it's so hard to understand and it's so hard to get to the bottom, and a lot of people are spouting off about, you know, oh, this is evil and the end of creative music as we know it, or this is the great thing that's gonna save the planet. And I think that. probably, like most things, the truth is somewhere in between. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I don't know, I don't know enough to. I'm just, I'm just thinking about income for musicians and where does it come from, because recordings used to be, now a lot of musicians say, certainly rock musicians say it's the live shows that's where you make money and um and then there's the multiple jobs because so many musicians teach or do other things to to make a living so uh, um uh that that's just what i wonder about as far as nurturing the music and where the income is going to come from but for the I, artist. I, I would just say, you know, on these panels, I've been on a few of them, and I, I always feel like it bears pointing out that I think in the history of music, live performances were always the bulk of musicians' income. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's going to be different now. So the recording industry is one thing that's going through massive changes, but the way that musicians survive is by for performing for people who want to hear them. And I, I don't, I'm not sure it's ever been any different. Chance for one more question. Get it while it's hot. Anybody? Yes, in the back. That's a great question. You want to come work for our agency? <laughs> that's what we're trying to figure out every day. No, it's a really great question. Um, there's, a, there's a couple parts to your question, I think, that I, would be helpful to kind of clarify. So on the one hand, the question is, how do I approach venues to come across personal and not like you're soliciting something? On the other hand, the part of the question is, how do you approach booking shows and a tour at large? Um, th there's there's kind of two ways to think about live performance, and I'm gonna be very general, so there's exceptions to the rule, but there's a big difference between hard ticket sales and soft ticket sales. Okay, hard ticket sales are when you go to a concert at the House of Blues, or you go to a concert at the Paradise Rock Club, or you go to a concert at the Middle East. Those are all hard ticket sales, which literally just means the club itself is relying exclusively on revenue from ticket sales. 
okay? Soft ticket sales means that, a, a good example of a soft ticket sale organization would be the Celebrity Series of Boston because they have subscribers. Mm -hmm. um, UMass Amherst is the first thing that came to mind. They have a really great fine arts series which is augmented by donate, you know, um, sponsorship and donors and so the bulk of their revenue is not exclusively from ticket sales, mm. okay? There's a big difference between the two. And as musicians, the thing that you need to keep in mind is that the hard ticket wor world only cares about how many tickets you're gonna sell, okay? Again, I'm generalizing, and if there's any soft ticket organizations out there listening to this, yes, your ticket sales are important too. But to be very <laughs> general, yes. hard ticket, that's all that they really care about. So what, what type of music are you hoping to perform live? I'm hoping to play jazz. Okay. <laughs> so you have a unique opportunity. Say that again. Yeah. Okay. So you have a unique opportunity then in that you can get your foot in the door with both worlds. Okay. We'll go back to the example of Donnie McCaslin, who was primarily known as a jazz artist until the Bowie connection happened and now his new concept and his aesthetic has changed and we're working with him to try and build the hard ticket fan base. But that doesn't mean you can't do both. That doesn't mean he can't do both or any artist can't do both. Um, so I, the point I'm trying to make is that there's a big difference between the two. And regardless, you don't want to discount fan management and your strategy for attracting fans because when you start to contact those clubs, at the end of the day, all they care about is, well, how many people are gonna come out to your show in Chicago, or how many people are gonna come out to your show in Des Moines, or pick any city in the USA that you've never been to. That's the only thing they care about. So if you can't, if you can't contact them um, with a message that says that, right, I played in Chicago and there were 500 people that came, um, then I can get to the first part of your question, which is how do you approach them in a way that doesn't feel like you're trying to sell them something and is more personal and everything like that. And, you know, some basic things that you can do um, that I would highly recommend. So I'm going to approach it from my side of the table, right, as, a, as an agent, getting solicitation from artists who I've never heard of and what the content of their emails looks like. I will gloss over 99% of, of all emails that clearly look like they were copied and pasted and sent out to 300 other agencies. And there's no connection whatsoever to the um, core capabilities that our agency is good at, right? It's very cut and paste. I'll gloss over 99% of those and, and just, you know, delete them or not even read them. If I get an email from an artist that's much more simple and just is friendly and says, hey, are you looking to sign new artists to your agency? And that's all it says, there's no links. They have my curiosity. They at least have my curiosity because I don't know who they're talking about. <laughs> they could be talking about their friend that is, you know, Wayne Shorter. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, I don't know who they're talking about, so at least I'm gonna engage them on that level. And there's, there's kind of a proven method to that, and it's called the nine-word email, which is exactly what it sounds like. So sending out an email which is nine words or less in the form of a question, your response rate is gonna be infinitely higher than if you do a cut and paste email. So you can use that strategy for um, approaching places that you're trying to play and not sending them a blanket. Like you want them to be curious enough to reply to you and say, oh yeah, we are looking to book a show in November. Um, who do you have in mind, right? Or, you know what I mean? You want them to come to you with the ask. Even though you're the one who's making the initial offer, you know, so as the agent, I'm actually the one making the initial offer to the venue. I'm offering this artist, this is the project, this is approximately how much it's gonna cost. That's, an, that's what I would consider an offer. My goal is to get an offer for the artist at the end of the day, but it's not gonna happen from the first point of communication, especially if I don't have a relationship with them. And that's the other part of what I'm trying to explain, which you already know, is it is a relationship business. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't matter if you're just starting out and you're picking up the phone and you're sending emails to someone you've never worked with or you've been doing it for a while, every day I'm still con contacting people that I've never worked with. So we're constantly trying to bridge right. the technolo technological gap of how do I make this personal um, and how do I ultimately try and build a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. But if you start simply like that, and you pique their curiosity, not, they know that you wanna play there. I guarantee you that they already know that. <laughs> you know, but if you, if you just leave it a little bit shorter and a little bit more real and practical, which is, you know, um, I, you could, another approach you could take would be to reference another group that's played at that venue that you might know. And you say, you could say something to the effect of, I, I've seen, you know, this band play at the venue. I was wondering how it did, okay? You don't have to allude to the end game for you, which is you wanna play there. You're trying to 
get to know their challenges from their end. And ultimately, you would want them to respond and say something like, you know, it did well, why do you ask, right? Something simple. Um, so I, so I, I think the, the gist of it is just to keep it really short and sweet up front and don't, don't, spend, don't spend a lot of time copying and pasting emails and sending them out to all the same venues because they're not gonna look at them because they just get too many of them. Right, right. And don't underestimate the power of picking up the phone. It's yes. much more powerful. Absolutely. You know, my general rule of thumb is call first. If you haven't um, received the call back, then send an email, then call again. Mm -hmm. And some combination of that in a specified amount of time, you will get a response eventually. It I might be the one that I got in that letter years ago. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but, but you got a response. Got a response. Yeah, I did get a response. <laughs> and that's happened. And then 10 years later was on the front of their monthly calendar when I went <laughs> and headlined there. there you go. But uh, also, you're a, a great trumpet player and a great composer. I've heard your music, David, so thanks for coming and for asking. And I, I, I think this is great advice. I have a, a follow-up question that if I were you, I would ask. But first, I would also say, like, something that was said earlier, telling stories. And Braithwaite was talking about how an artist has to learn how to tell a story about their work. So you, you need to sort of think about what is the context of what I'm doing? And how would somebody sort of understand and be curious and interested in what it is? And some of that comes from, you know, pictures. What does your graphic Yes. vibe look like, you know, that pictures speak a thousand words. So you, you know, you want to think about how do I tell John about this music in a way that's going to make some sense in the context of everything else that's going on and that he's heard, and he, why would this new artist that I'm about to take a look at pique my curiosity and create something, something of interest? And so that's going to go for um, venues, for labels, for managers, for anyone in the industry, we're in it, we're all in it because we love the music. So when we see a good story, none of us are any different. We're, we're going to follow the lead and, and take the bait and try to see what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think Mike's thing of not putting too much information right up front because people are just going to get overwhelmed. Even if you just have a link and he goes to your page and you've got like way too much information there, he's just going to be like, okay, I don't know what to do with this. Yeah. Right? right? So the question I would ask as a follow-up is, okay, the nine-word email, um, as an artist who's just emerging and entering the field, um, building a career and wanting to play at some of these venues that I know and love, is at this point, should I send the email myself from my own personal email? Or would it be better to find somebody to be doing that for me on my behalf? That's a great, great follow-up question, Dave. Well, thank you. <laughs> and I want to answer it. And I thought of one other thing, which I know you're fully aware of, too, which is don't discount the opportunities you could have to play at those venues as part of somebody else's Absolutely. band. Absolutely. So I you can meet yes. the actual club promoter, yeah. right, get to know them. And um, again, it's a relationship business. Mm -hmm. But don't, don't, when you're there in the club on someone else's gig, yeah, go yeah. up and try to get your own gig yeah. that same night. No, you know, no. let a little time pass. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But right. yeah, for sure. Right. Right. Definitely introduce yourself. But I would say to answer your question, Dave, that it, at this stage in the game, it doesn't really matter because hmm. your goal is that you're trying, because you don't have the relationship with them. So whether it's personal from you or somebody sent it on behalf of you, let's just assume that the recipient doesn't know either of you. So in that sense, it doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, is trying to, it, it is about trying to strike up a dialogue and a relationship. And going back to what we all said at the very beginning, that yes, this industry changes every day, but there is so much opportunity to take advantage of. So an example could be, why, don't, why not use LinkedIn to look up the, co the concert promoter and to read up a little bit about them and to figure out, do you know anybody that knows that person and to, and to try to maximize your network that way? Um, to make a personal connection. Um, when I worked at a, the, a previous agency, and I, uh, e even though the agency was known, I wasn't. So I, in that sense, it was completely new f from the idea that they didn't know me, right? They might know other people who worked there, but I had to kind of start from ground up, uh, or from square one, and build those new relationships. So I would do that. I would look at LinkedIn. I would use Facebook. I would do whatever I could to 
try and make the process personal because you're not trying to book yourself there just once and never play there again. You're trying to think long term and you know, this is, a, um, this is something that you want to have as repeat business, mm -hmm. right? And so at some point as a new artist, you're going to have to convince them that you're gonna, you guys are taking a chance on me, but I'm taking a chance on you and, you know, and we're going to start this relationship together. And there's so many good examples of artists who have been successful at that and the clubs like to have them back because they're, the clubs know that they are invested in the success of their show. Mm -hmm. So there will be a point in your communication where you absolutely want to show your dedication to the process and help them talk about how you're going to market the show. Because if you've never played there before and they don't know who you are and their audience doesn't know who you are, how can they market you? If, if, you know, or you could get a good publicist like Anne who could help you. But, but you still have, to, still have to have a story. And I think, did you mention photos? Somebody mentioned, I think Dave, Dave mentioned yeah. photos. I can't tell you how important it is as an artist to have a good photo. Um, I work with a lot of artists. I'm thinking about in one, Sarah Serpa, who's an NEC alum, she has great photos. She happens to look amazing in them, but she, her photos get chosen all the time. Just in the Globe. I wrote Just a in preview the piece and I, yeah. I was shocked because you, I was supposed to pick 15 shows, so 15 mm -hmm. different artists and it was, Sarah is doing a show with Ran Blake, and I thought, well, they'll probably run a photo of Ran, right. if anybody. And, and, but Sarah had these, I didn't even she see this photo. Photos. I just send the stuff to yeah. the Globe and all the links and everything. And whoever was picking them out, he, he picked this, it was like an Edie Sedgwick shot from 1967 or something. And, um, uh, but it, and it, it ended up everywhere. It was. Absolutely. I thought, oh, they're just using it for online. It looks so no, good it online. Was it was like too. It, it was, was in print. It was, and it was. Um, so yeah, and and it, it's certainly better than no photo at all, right. which I've right. also run into. It's yeah. like Do you have a photo, something high res, something that isn't just a gallery live shot of you, you know, badly composed right, right. photo that your friend took at the, your last gig. Um, so yeah, photos are good. And sometimes a unique photo. I mean, a lot of people have great headshots and you know, just a little different. And I don't know what that is all the time. I know it when I see it, but I can't tell you what that would be for you, but it's something a little different, a little unique. Well, I think this is maybe a natural stopping point. I know we're at about time. A quick thank you to all five of our panelists here. This has been great. Just a quick reminder, uh, Dave Douglas plays with NEC Jazz tomorrow night at 7.30 in Jordan Hall. Tickets are free, I believe, right? Yes. Yep, you do need a ticket, but it's free. Uh, and then uh, we have our pitch night tonight, too, if you're interested in seeing what some of our students and alumni are up to at 6 o'clock in the Black Box Theater. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank and Dave, you. You, Thank you. Dave, you're going to play Charms of the Night Sky? Is that Actually, right? we are, yes. So For the first time in like, many years. From like 1998, so something yeah, like that. Something like that. That's and the and date I, actually, got, I probably got it wrong. But. There's a <laughs> student who plays accordion, and there's a violinist, and so it's actually really interesting. A to rare opportunity to hear this work. So, yeah. Yeah, We're going to play that. We're also going to play some of the brass music from the album that I wrote for the Westerlies, and also some of the hymns that I recorded with Aoife O'Donovan and my quintet about five years ago. So it'll be, I've never done anything like it. Awesome. That's the kind of information I'm looking for. You're not just gonna be jamming on blues and rhythm changes, you know, it's just gonna, it's, it's gonna be special. So <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming, everyone.